Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of Shake Sales. Super pumped here. I'm, I'm the CEO of Mailshake. I'm super pumped to talk to Jay, Jay Barrows. John, welcome, man. Uh, I don't even think you need an intro. If you don't know, if, if you're in sales, you don't know who John is, uh, you're living in a rock and you're probably going to be in that population that uh, is no longer relevant. John, what's up, man? Hey, brother. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, I don't know if I'm that cool, but uh, but yeah, I've been around for a while. Let's put it that way. I think that longevity means something in this world. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, you, yeah. I mean, a lot of probably evolution, revolutions of stuff. But uh, today I want to talk about another evolution, which is the future of the sales role, right? Um, with AI, with the, just the state of budgets and whatever is happening today. Uh, where do you see this going? Yep. Uh, I, I don't, see, well, let's put it this way. I think I, I see it going in a very positive direction for those who are willing to evolve with it. Um, and I see sales reps being extremely valuable in the future for the ones who figure out how to leverage what's going on and how to add value in this world. The unfortunate part is I don't think the majority of sales reps are going to be in that bucket. I, I, I think we're in Pareto's rule right now. It's the 80, 20. I think 20% of the reps are going to be able to figure out how to leverage this AI stuff and how to shift their approach and add massive amounts of value to the engagement with the client. So the client actually wants to engage with them. The other 80% are just going to get replaced um, by AI. And, and, I, and the easiest way to prove this, quite frankly, is, and I challenge everybody who's listening to this right now to do this, is just go in ChatGPT or go into perplexity and pretend like you're a customer. Right. So pretend like you are a prospect for your business and just ask it some questions. You know, so for me, I'd be like, hey, perplexity, um, I'm a VP of sales in a tech, you know, a tech SaaS company. Um, our ACV is this, our products are this. Here's some of my challenges. I'm looking at the JB sales training. Tell me what I need to know about it. How does JB sales training compare to the other train? You know, what are some of his top competitors and why are they, what's the you know pros and cons? Could you take a look at some of his reviews? And when you realize that you get more value out of a five to 10 minute conversation of a, of a tool like an AI chat GPT, then you do a sales rep who's just going to drone through bant questions at, you know, go through their demo without engaging, you know, and it's pretty obvious where, where things are going right now. I mean, Gartner put out this report in 2022 that, uh, they averaged out boomers, millennials, and Gen Xers, B2B buyers of complex um, solutions. This wasn't like B2C. And they said that uh, on average, 43% of clients want a rep-free experience. They do not want a sales rep involved in the sales process. Um, now, that's the good news. Or I'm sorry, the bad news. The good news is, is that of those 43% that wanted a rep-free experience, they had a 23% higher regret rate. So they regretted what they bought more when we weren't involved. So it does tell me that there's a ton of value for us to add in this process. It's just different than it ever has been before. And, and we need to become true problem solvers, not just sales reps, right? Issue diagnosis, trying to find the root cause, those type of things, you know, bringing new solutions to the table that might not be yours and might not be your commission that you get for closing that deal, but it's the right thing to do because of the vendor they need partnering up with your competitors and knowing exactly where you are great and where they're great and where you're not great, making a recommendation to your you know, client of, you know what, you should probably go work with them because that's what their specialty is. I mean, I just did that right before we got on this call. Kevin Dorsey is a great friend of mine, right? And he's a, to a certain degree, a competitor. He has a management training program and all this other stuff. And I do management training, but it's kind of wrapped within my training, right? It's not how to be a manager. Client came to me and said, look, we need management one-on-one training. I don't, you know, they need to know how to run metrics and they, you know, these one-on-ones and everything like that. And I'm like, as much as I probably could have closed it and I probably could have done an okay job delivering it, it wasn't a perfect fit. It wasn't my strength. And so guess what? Just sent them over to Kevin say, go talk to him, take care of that. Once your management stuff's in place, then we can do maybe some training for your reps. And that's where I might, you know, be able to really help you out. So it's, it's, it's an evolution and we're, we're transitioning out of a legacy sales model right now. And the people that don't recognize it are going to get replaced. Makes sense. Yeah. I think the I think we've been in that transition phase and then COVID boom, kind of like since everyone was buying, people just can get away with being lazy slash not changing. Um, but with the catalyst of AI, I think, you're you're right. Like the be, I think the buyer behavior is probably going to change too, right? Like where they might not go to you first, they might even 
just ask chat gpt or whatever right they never they, will, they definitely won't come to us first you know i mean corporate executive board put out put out that stat a long time ago that by the time somebody does come to us they're already 60 to 70 percent of the way through the sales process they're already doing their research online they're already looking at you know all the options and the forums and the you know when they identify the fact that they need your solution they're doing their homework before they engage with anybody um and ai is just going to make that that much easier right so that's why, yeah. I mean, there's a stat that's been going around about how only, you know, about 5% of anybody's addressable market is actually in market for the solution that they sell, right? So the other 95% of our addressable market is at some stage of never needing our stuff to maybe needing it, but not a priority and, and up the chain. So that's why you almost have to look at, for instance, outbound prospecting right now as a marketing function. You don't have, you don't almost have to, you have to, because mm -hmm. straight cold, anything right now, pff, tell me a company that's killing it on straight, cold, nothing, you know, straight, cold, right? And I don't mean like somebody with a great brand who's cold calling into a, you know, a very tight addressable market. That's different. Right. But if you just get a list and hammer away, like that is a fool's errand right now. So you can't look at it as a sales function, in my opinion, anymore. Because the likelihood of you cold calling somebody and then picking them up and being like, oh man, I've never heard of this before. Let me dump all my other priorities and start into a sales cycle with you. And I, like, if you look at it that way, it's, it, you're going to be really demoralized. Okay. Um, but if you look at it more as a marketing function where that cold call is a touch, right? An impression mm -hmm. point that might lead them to go look at the email that might lead them to go to your website that might lead them to come inbound in some way, shape or form. So that's why the SDR role almost has to fall under marketing and operations because it, to me, it's mar far more of a function of marketing right now than it is in sales. I love it. I think uh, this is, you bring a, a great point, which is the, the buying cycle or the selling today is not just selling. It's selling, marketing, understanding the customer's needs. Uh, it's like, I'm, I'm call that customer success. It's all kind of converging into one area. And, you know, like I'll, I'll give you a really, so for the folks that are listening in that 80% or whatever that are maybe not going to make it or, hey, what the heck is changing? So we have a company called ZoomShift. So I, I have a portfolio of companies. Uh, ZoomShift sch HR scheduling software. Uh, we cannot compete with our competitors in marketing channels. Like we can't afford it. Like it's just, we're bootstrapped. Like we don't have, like it costs us, Two three thousand dollars cap to get one customer, yep. and that just wouldn't make sense. We would get like ten customers before we were out of money or our budget. Um, but we do outbound. We just started this maybe seventy five days ago. Um, it's actually the best marketing channel. Direct results from outbound. Like we got a couple customers here and there, but we spend. I'll give you hard numbers. We spend ten grand a month mm -hmm. on outbound. It is the best marketing. It's driven more value and more trials. And, uh, the, again, the marketing metrics yep. for the company went up 30% of new, new increase in trials. And we dug in, we're like, where did this come from? And it, it didn't always originate from outbound. Like I can't, I couldn't fully attribute to it. Maybe like 20% of it I could attribute to it. The other 80% was just like, Oh, direct traffic. Well, what do we do differently? Fortunately, this is the only one thing we did differently. Well, duh. Like if that's the only thing we changed, yeah. guess what? Um, so like up on some looking channel. Yeah. I mean, that's, and that's it. And I think that's where it started. And I think if we, if we could just get rid of attribution, we'd all just get along and like, who gives yeah. a shit where the meeting comes from, man? Like, you know, I tell this story all the time. Morgan Ingram used to work with me. And when I brought him on board, like he, you know, he would be doing outbound into these target accounts that he was going after. Right. And we're small enough where when an inbound came, it, it hit my, it hit my inbox. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I would then open up Salesforce and I would say, okay, right. Cause I want to make, give, make sure people get credit. Um, and I would see all this activity that Morgan was doing into that account. Right. Now the person that came to us through the inbound wasn't the person he was going after. It was, there was no track of like, okay, this person Morgan's been going after for a while, but he'd been going after multiple people within the organization for a period of time. 
You cannot tell me that all that activity that he did in there didn't drive somebody to go, hey, you know what? Why don't you go take a look at them and set up a call and, and then allowed them to come to us their way, the way they wanted to communicate with us. And so I would always give them credit for it. You know, I'd be like, mm-hmm. okay, cool. Like as, as, if you were in there, you know, and you were, you, and you have, you know, a few activities and you were, you know, doing some decent stuff there. Like the fact that it came inbound doesn't mean that you don't get credit for it. And I think if mm-hmm. we were to just be able to figure out a way to still compensate sales reps on the upside, <clears throat> but take away attribution, um, I think it'd be a far, like we'd be able to, that, that alone would solve the sales marketing divide. Yeah. Uh, right. But yeah, I mean, sales reps in general, they have to be mini marketers and companies have to get comfortable with sales reps. So you, you talk about a perfect use case, you know, oh man, we don't have any marketing app. You have 50 rep, you know, you, have, however many reps you have, like I just talked to a client, I had 50 reps. Um, say you have 20 reps. You have 20 megaphones out there on social that if you empower the right way, you don't have to pay another dime for marketing. Yeah, if You show your reps how to build their brand, how to share content. And I don't mean sharing content about your business and you know the specific products you sell. I mean, sharing content around what's happening in the industry and what they're learning along the way and you know persona-based stuff and whatever it is. And you can cross off a lot of boxes there, right? Like you can, the business acumen goes up while they learn about the industry and the personas, that type of stuff. They share stuff on social that they're learning and whatever it is. And all of a sudden, the brand gets out there. And mm-hmm. so that brand, it's hard to tr- tie attribution to a lot of quote unquote brand stuff, but that's the only way to go right now. It really is because if you don't have a brand, I mean, think about it, right? It, think about a company's brand versus an individual's brand. Just go on LinkedIn and look at the number one person at that company, their LinkedIn profile, and then look at the company's LinkedIn profile. It's mm-hmm. a no brainer. Nobody gives a shit about what, what the company does. You post something on yeah. a company profile, you get like five likes and you know whatever, ten impressions. You post something on a, somebody's personal profile, it goes through the roof. And so, being a mini marketer and doing it in a way that is authentic, that's real, that's value add, those type of things, while you do some outbound prospecting, while you do some networking and build your portfolio, like you have to, we have to go back to that full cycle sales rep that can pretty much do everything um, with a brand. Or else, I again, I it's just too obvious to me how much how valuable AI is in this equation, and mm-hmm. it's, it's hard not to look at it and say, uh, yeah, <laughs> like yeah, fair uh, enough. Why would I want to talk to a sales rep who's going to ask me bant questions, drone through demos, not give a shit? You know what I mean? Like, I'd much rather talk to an AI. Fair enough. Yeah. So uh, I want to touch on one thing, and then we'll, we'll we'll wrap up with one more question, but. You mentioned a lot of things here. One, and, and Morgan is actually, I would say the poster boy of the future of sales. Like he's built his, from my experience, he's built his personal brand, right? Uh, he's built lots of connections in this space. Mm-hmm. I, from every time I, we, we engage with him when we were working with you and well, he was our person to work with, uh, with our reps and, he was like, ah, like we can't help you here, but like you should go talk to this guy, right? And we actually ended up working with uh, KD uh, as a result, and, and, and you know, continued engagement. Or like rehired you guys in the future, or whatever. But like all those things he just did yeah. by doing right for the customer, by building that personal brand as a human, right? I think the the difference between a, a human and Chat GPT or AI is like I trust you, John, because. I can Google you and, or I, I've seen 50 videos. Mm-hmm. You're in my face. And by default, you are the, the guy who knows sales training because I've just consumed your content. And that's more like touch point, whatever. I trust you. Anything you have to say over any AI, even though the AI might be doing, it might be less biased and may, may have access to a greater pool of information because of what you've done like day in day out right and you can't beat that um yeah well we can't i mean i think you and i can't right because because of the age we're at and the experience we had and how we grew up without this but my 13 year old daughter hmm, i don't know I, I mean i did an experiment recently uh so i had guy kawasaki on my on my podcast and when i was prepping for him 
I, uh, I, I was watching some interviews and I came across an interview he did where he talked about how he had created Kawasaki GPT. And Kawasaki GPT, he said straight up, yeah. it had every one of his books, every one of his things. He said straight up, if you ask Kawasaki GPT a question, you'll get a better answer than me. And so I decided to challenge, challenge him on that premise. So the day before I was interviewing Guy Kawasaki, the live Guy of Kawasaki, I went on his chat GPT, on his Kawasaki GPT, and I asked the same questions. And then I asked him the same, the, the questions during the live interview. And um, at the end, uh, and I didn't tell him, and I, at the end I said, Guy, you know, um, <laughs> you know, I know you're a huge proponent of AI. I, I just want to let you know, I, I already had this conversation with you last night. And he was like, what? I was like, you, I, you told me about, I learned about your Kawasaki GPT. And you, guess what? You were right. It gave me better answers. And so my, and he kind of joked and he was like, well, then why am I, not, you know, why am I here? Then why am I not out surfing? Ha ha ha. And I'm like, guy, that's actually my question to you is if I got more value out of having a conversation with Kawasaki GPT, what's the point of this conversation? And to your point, um, I think you and I will always, I, I posted this yesterday, as a matter of fact, um, I think a certain age range will always crave the human interaction purely because we want human interaction purely mm -hmm. right regardless of the value i get as long as this is a good conversation there's value in it and it's somewhat positive right mm -hmm. but how many good conversations do you have from a sales perspective i mean you've been sold to hundreds of times i'm sure before right how often do you thoroughly enjoy that sales engagement process and the sales rep brings a ton of value to you and gets you to think about things in a way that doesn't feel like you're being pitched or drone through or going through a, you know, a, you know, a discovery That's, process. It's rare, right? I mean, zero, right? Like, uh, I, I often, I think you said this earlier, like when I go by as an executive, I do my research beforehand, right? Like, my rule of thumb is don't ask questions you can Google. So I go in and do my research. I go talk to three people just to make sure I do my homework, right? And and I always get the first 25 minutes of the call like the same shit I looked up in two minutes before the call, right? And I'm like, first of all, this could have been an email or this could have been a Slack, you know, Slack message or like whatever. Like if you just sent me this, I would have looked at it. Or you said, if they just took the time to say like, hey, where are you at in this buying process? And I'm like, I have two questions or one question. Or like, do you integrate with this? All right. Um, so yeah, I get it. And that's the difference. And that's what I think reps need to get good at is understanding a sophisticated buyer versus an uns unsophisticated buyer. Because what yeah. you just mapped out there is a sophisticated buyer, right? You've done your homework, you're 60 to 70% of the way through, whatever it is. And so if I try to bring you through my selling process and back you into it and say, okay, well, no, 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 I can't just, I can't just give you pricing. I need to, I got to ask you these questions. I got to go, I got to bring my AE in. I got to bring my SE in. If you put, if somebody like you, you put through that process, Process, you're out. You're like, screw it. I'm out. I'm going to go find another option because there's a million of them out there. Right. But for the person that, that has been told, Hey, go look at some options for this problem that we have. I, and they've never bought that before. That's an unsophisticated buyer. So that's mm -hmm. where you have the chance to lead the process a little bit. Right. Where it's like, okay, well, let's back into this. Like you, you don't know what you don't know yet. Right. So mm -hmm. I think that, and that's, the, that's the difference, right? AI can do that very quickly. You know what I mean? It can, mm -hmm. it can, it, and by the way, it can also adjust to your style versus mine. I mean, I did this experiment with my daughter. She's 13. She's struggling in math. Algebra one, she, you know, her teacher teaches it one way and she doesn't really understand it. So we got her a tutor. The tutor teaches it in a different way. So it actually makes it more confusing for her. So I created a prompt in my chat GPT and I said, Hey, act as the best math tutor for a 13 year old go girl going through a, you know, uh, algebra one. You can't cheat. You, you can't let her cheat. You can't give her the answers, but you can coach her through it by asking questions giving samples and that type of thing so i set the parameters and i gave it to her and she had a better experience because it it, it adjusted to her style versus mm -hmm. somebody like me training wise by the way you know i i stand up in front of 20 30 50 100 people there is no way i can adjust my training style to fit a hundred different people's learning style AI i can you know, are you going to want to have a beer with me? Absolutely. Are you going to want to have chop it up and just talk, you know, about random stuff and ideate on things? Like, I think that's, you know, part. but when it comes to like the delivery of content, when it comes to the delivery of, of knowledge, if you will, and I mean that through an email, through a call, through a discovery thing, like through training, 
it's it's hard for me to see how AI isn't already better than us. And so how can we survive by, you know, being the last mile? And I think that's the key here is that you let, you know, let the AI do all the heavy lifting, let it do the research for you. But the thing I'll leave here with is, you know, it's it's the difference between augmentation versus automation. So many people are looking to use AI to automate a lot of stuff. Like everybody's running to the front end of the funnel. Like, oh, look at this. And I, I didn't get such a fool's errand. Like you're just going to send better crappy emails at scale. Good for you. Like you might be able to hit the personalization at scale button. But mm -hmm. what's the point? And if you automate it, by the way, congratulations, you just automated yourself out of a job. But if you augment if you use it to do the research, to do it, to write the majority of the email that you then ideate on and adjust and hits, you know, before you hit send, now you can create massive efficiencies. You can get better ideas. You can, you know, those type. you can learn things, but you, you got to look at it as an augmentation, not automation. And, and as soon as you look at it as automation, you might as well be looking for another job. Hmm. Fair enough. Yeah. I appreciate that. So, John, thanks so much for joining the show. Uh, where can people go to keep in touch and get the latest video and content? Yeah, I mean, jbarrows.com is the easiest place. But, you know, what I would suggest is, you know, people jump on board my newsletter that I just launched. Uh, we're, we've got 30,000 people on it. We've got a 68% open rate, which is pretty bananas. Um, and what I'm, I'm calling the JB Sales Learning Lab. So if you go to uh, jbarrows.com slash newsletter, um, it's my learning lab newsletter, which is effectively me, me learning out loud. Cause I'm selling out there every day, you know, I, I you know, these, <laughs> these influencers that were super successful five, 10, you know, years ago in the SAS when money was free, eh, you know, if you're not selling in today's market, I have a hard time listening to you because things are different now. So that's why I'm out selling every single day and translating what I'm seeing out there to the audience. Uh, so that'd be the best way to get value. Um, but you can always hit me up on LinkedIn and all these other places as well. Love it. Thanks, man. Appreciate your time.